lead that You're somebody. Right. You're right. You never know. And just because someone is offering you encouragement, it does not mean that they're not experiencing difficult times in their life while at the same time they're trying to be a blessing to yes. you. Yes. So therefore you should never take it for granted when somebody invests a kind word or a word of encouragement to your life and for your spiritual well-being. Amen. I think a lot of times we expect more out of people than we really should. But it is good when people are in their own free will, like Paul is here to Timothy, offering words of encouragement, though his life is full of confusion and frustration. He's trying to be there for a young preacher. An older preacher trying to help a younger preacher. And preachers need to be encouraged too sometimes. And I'd like to say a special thank you to the Bethel Baptist Church and the dinner y'all served Sunday and the cards and the gifts and the meals and the handshakes and the hugs and everything else to encourage your preacher. I'm not saying that in a way to have a pity party as if nobody ever encourages me because some would think that. That's not the case. But nevertheless, it is still a true statement that sometimes you've got to be able to look over your issues and what you're dealing with at the moment to be able to offer a word of encouragement to somebody else that is in maybe not as in bad a shape as you are, but could be. Yes, sir. Paul is showing here in one verse of Scripture his selflessness and his, and his encouraging young little Timothy. Stressed out to the max, Timothy is at his wit's end. He is pastoring the church there in Ephesus and he's having a rough go at it. And people in his day have turned or turning their self to teachers having itching ears. You can read about what kind of people he's dealing with. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Don't turn there. He's dealing with proud, boasters, blasphemers, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Timothy needed somebody to come along and encourage him. And Paul, in spite of being in prison, maybe not at the time of this exact writing, some commentaries have said that during the writing of 1 and 2 Timothy that Paul was liberated from prison for a short time and shortly after writing 2 Timothy he was back in prison in Rome. Paul spent a lot of time in deep, dark dungeons. And many people would wonder why God allowed Paul to experience such harsh judgment and treatment in this life. Some might even would say it's not fair to look at Paul who was a man of faith and power and boldness. But friend, were it not for those prison moments that he was allowed to spend that time, you and I wouldn't have most of the New Testament sitting in our lap. For it was in those times that he found time to put down on paper what God would have him share with generations to come. So it's not just in your moment that God is trying to do something. It may be years, maybe even hundreds of years that your life might have an impact on somebody else. Mama. How we react to the issues that we're dealing with at the time could have an effect on encouraging people on down the road. I don't want to be one of those that's not offering a word of encouragement. And if there's one thing that we need today, we need some more people with an encouraging spirit like old Barnabas had. Amen. Lord, give us some people that will raise up a generation and a group of people. Though we've got our own problems, I'm not minimizing that. But one for the sake of God and His church and the next generation be able to get above our little problem for a while and say, yes, I've got it bad, but this person over here does too. That person needs somebody 
to help them out. In verse number 12, Paul, there's a lot of things here in this one little old bitty verse of Scripture that I want to share with you three points that I think Paul was really sharing with Timothy that if you're going through something tonight, this will help you triumph through your trial. Let me say that again. Paul was trying to share with Timothy how to triumph through his trial. Now, I don't know if he caught up with it or not, but I know that there's a preacher 2,000 and some years later that lived over here in the middle of nowhere pastoring a little Baptist church that kind of caught on to a little bit as to what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. Maybe God didn't put that down there for Timothy to find the nugget at that time, but maybe God put it in there for your pastor to find a nugget in that verse of Scripture to help somebody thousands of years later make it through a trial in your life. Amen. Say, does God have that deep of a foreknowledge? You better believe it, friend. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He knows the end from the beginning. That's right. Amen. I feel like even leaving my text, I feel so much God in my speaking right now, I don't even know if I should start. Go ahead, Pastor. But I believe I need to. In this verse of Scripture, I want you to notice the first thing Paul mentions, and that he is notice a cause worth suffering. Look with me in verse number 12. For the which, watch, cause, I also suffer these things. What was he talking about? What things was he suffering? He was suffering all kinds of things. What kind of cause was it? First of all, in verse number 9, you'll see that it was a glorious cause was the reason he was suffering. Look at verse 9. Who has saved us. Let me tell you one of the first reasons why Paul was suffering in his life is because he was saved. That's why. He never was suffering until he got saved. He never was struggling until he got saved. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee above all Pharisees. You say, preacher, what in the world and how and why well, is this cause going to... I'll tell you why you ought to suffer. Here's a good cause for to help you make it through your trial. Is that God seen fit to reach down where you was, save you by the good grace of God, forgive you of all your sin. You say, preacher, I don't think I can take it anymore. Friend, you need to go back to the day in your mind that you made and you had an encounter with the God of glory Amen. and realize there's a glorious cause worth suffering through this life. Amen. Number two, it's a grace cause. Look at verse 9 again. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. You want me to tell you another, another cause worth suffering in this life is the grace of God that He shed abroad in our life. Amen. The fact that He would do it. Another cause, a gospel cause. Look at verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If you see this, he's leading up to that verse. He's leading up to the reason why he's suffering. He said, I'm suffering for these causes. What causes were they? The gospel cause, friend. That's why Paul said, it's worth it all. This is the cause of my suffering. And if God allows me to suffer more, Paul was saying, so be it that the gospel of this God-man might continue to go into all the world. You say, preacher, I just don't know if that's a cause worth suffering for. Well, friend, he looked at our poor pitiful life through the eyes of foreknowledge and saw in us who were nobody's a cause worth suffering for. Yeah. Oh yeah, he saw you in your backslidden, drunken, rebellious state. He sees us even now. He saw that we would be who we are, yet he saw us and loved us anyway. He said you're a cause worth suffering for. Thank God. And if there's anything that ought to help us triumph through a trial, it's the gospel sake. For the sake of the gospel. 
Does anybody even know what the gospel means anymore? Y'all awful quiet. Oh, the gospel is the power of God that bringeth salvation to every man that believeth to the Jew first and yeah. also to the Greek. Yeah. The gospel is the reason you're saved tonight. The gospel is the reason your sins are forgiven. Oh, the gospel is the reason heaven is prepared. The gospel is the reason we're going there one day. The gospel is the reason you got joy in your heart. Yeah. The gospel is the reason you can pillow your head down tonight. The gospel is the reason the birds are singing. The sun is a shining. The gospel is the reason the stars are twinkling. The gospel is the reason the rivers are still flowing. The fish are still swimming. And the birds are still singing. I'm telling you the gospel is a cause we're suffering for. Amen. Some people say, well, if Paul says, so, let me give you the fourth cause, a cause we're suffering. It's not only a glorious cause saved, a grace cause, a gospel cause, but a Gentile cause. Look at verse 11. Where unto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. But then notice he goes right into verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Yeah. <laughs> All those things I just mentioned to you is the reason he was suffering. He said it's a good cause to suffer for. Who's the Gentiles? The Gentiles was nothing more than a bunch of dogs referred to in the Bible. They were those who were not the chosen of God. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were the people who were rejected. You say, who is a Gentile? Anybody that ain't a Jew is a Gentile. And you and I was nothing but a bunch of Gentile dogs. You better be thankful that Paul was willing to go through the suffering for the sake of a bunch of Gentile dogs. Those that would get saved and come to know him. In other words, people might get saved through your life and what you go through. That's a good cause worth suffering and triumphing and making it through whatever you're dealing with in your life. One of the biggest problems is in our generation, we've got the me and the I syndrome. Bad. I believe that. We're so stuck on ourselves, it ain't even funny. Got a couple that's honest, but it's the truth. Yes. Selfishness. And I've never in my life. You want me to tell you why I think it is that way? Or how I can say that and pretty much feel like I'm right? Is the burden that we have for those that are lost. Yes, sir. That's right. It's missing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Used to, I remember when I first got saved, self included. I remember weeping for hours on the altar. Nobody around. Not for myself. Not for my family. Not for my issues. But for the soul of somebody else. Yes, sir. Now, let me prove my point to you. How long has it been since you shed a tear or had a burden for anybody else, their soul, but your own? Oh, me, brother. Most of us, all we think about is our house, our roof, our shingles, our cars, our yard, our porch. Carnal things. Without ever really giving any thought to reality and eternity. That that's forever. And one of the reasons why people quit on God so much today is simply because of a lack of a burden. They don't realize the people that they're going to have a negative impact on that may never come to know Jesus if they don't triumph through their trial in their life. Right, yes, sir. Most people don't care. Paul said that that's a cause worth suffering. He wanted to have an impact on the Gentiles and other people's life. Let me ask you something. And I'm going to get serious tonight here with us in person. Who is it in your life that you're trying to have a godly impact on? 
I'm not talking about a good impact. There's some good people all in here and godly people, but is there anybody in your life that you're trying to have a, and teach them in the paths of God? Other than your own family. Boy, it's done got real, real quiet. Most of us don't even teach our own family. Most of them got quiet. I was told when that happens that uh, one of the two things, either the sermon's dead or you're in the right road. And I've been feeling enough God to know the sermon ain't dead. So I believe I'm in the right road. You are right. You are. Most of us don't even teach our own family the ways of God, much less invest in the life of anybody else. Amen. And yet Paul said, for the Gentiles' sake, that was a cause worth suffering for. A lot of people quit, throw in a towel, and they never have had a burden for nobody but themselves. And there's going to be people in your life that you've been in contact with, and you're born again, and you're saved, and you're going to heaven. But because you don't have a burden for their soul, they're going to end up dying and going to hell. You say, preacher, you really mean that? What if somebody don't tell them that's where they're headed? Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Good. That's why Paul was able to try it through his trials going through prison. And the more you read this verse, the more encouragement you get from a man whose life is not a bed of roses. He didn't even have a helpmate. Some of y'all men will say, well, bless God, that's why he was able to do it so good he didn't have nobody screaming in his ear. <laughs> no. A wife to be there to encourage you through a difficult time in your life is a wonderful thing, yes. friend. Yes. That's a blessing. That's a wonderful, a wonderful privilege. Solomon was correct when he said, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. I got a good thing. Sit right over there. Not you, Brother Brian, but I heard. <laughs> That's my good thing right there. He didn't have nobody to lift him up. That's not what it was about. And by the way, it was so important to them. Watch this now. I hope this comes real to all of us tonight. Watch this now. The only way of communication they had was either by word of mouth or parchment. That's the only way. In other words, he had to write it down on a piece of paper. That's the way God had it sent. And it wasn't a Hallmark card. Thank God for them things. You can go to CVS and buy. They get pretty expensive though. About got to go to the dollar store anymore. <laughs> To find a good card or make them yourself on your computer at home. But no, he couldn't find a card that would say exactly what needed to be said. So he said, I need to put this down on paper. When somebody writes it down on paper, that means more than just saying it. It really does. And Paul was saying there's a cause worth suffering. Number two, look at verse 12. There's a confidence here worth sharing. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Watch this. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Do y'all feel his confidence? Oh, yes. I mean, here's a man that's hated. He's tried to be a blessing to the church of Corinth, and they despise him everywhere he goes. It's disruption and disturbance, and there's prison guards looking for him, and he's uh, like he's running for his life everywhere he goes. And yet, in the midst of all of it, he's able to muster up some words of encouragement and be confident to a young little preacher. Says, "Hey, by the way, pay no attention. And if you did, listen to this. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I am persuaded. Amen. For I." That's the problem with a lot of people. They don't really know who they believe. Yep. There will come a time in your life where you better know who yes. you believe. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. This confidence is seen. What, what was it that 
And he said, he used a word in here that got my attention. He says, for I know whom I have believed. Watch. And am persuaded. Now that word persuaded has given us an idea, Tim, that something had happened in his life. That there was a time where he wasn't persuaded. So God had done something to get his attention. What had God done? How did God persuade him that his confidence was so high now during this struggle in his life to maintain that level of confidence? What had God done? Glad you asked. I want to share them with you, all right? Well, what did God use to persuade Paul? Well, God persuaded Paul by the blessings that he had sent. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, I'll quote it to you. Paul had said in there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings Amen. in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Let me tell you why Paul was able to be confident through this trying time in his life and offer words of encouragement is because he hadn't forgot the blessings that God spiritually had poured in his life. Amen. See, that's another problem. Most Christians today are so carnal they don't recognize spiritual blessings. Yes, sir. right. Yeah. The most blessings that most people realize today is how much money God gives them, how good a job God gives them, how nice a car or house God gives them. That's really the only blessings that a carnal Christian is ever going to realize. But listen, friend, the greatest blessings that you and I have tonight, yeah. they are not carnal, but they're spiritual blessings. Yeah. The peace of God in our heart, the joy unspeakable and full of glory, the confidence that we have in Him, knowing that we've been justified to God, meaning we're in right standing with Him. We've been reconciled to Him, meaning we're no longer enemies. We're no longer under the wrath of God. That's a blessing that we have through Christ. Jesus. Amen. That's why that kind of preaching don't draw big crowds, but you get these health and wealth guys. Yeah. And start talking about carnal things. Yeah. That's what draws the masses. Mm -hmm. Oh, you give us this and God. No, God does bless us with carnal things. Yes, Y'all tell that. <laughs> he blesses us with carnal things. But for the average Christian, carnal blessings is all they can really comprehend because they're not spiritual minded. Yeah. That's why our churches are full of all kinds of carnality and people quit when they're going through a trial in their life. They don't understand the spiritual side of this thing. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. <laughs> Paul said, hey! I'm seeing this. His confidence... Is because of the blessings God had sent. What's this? It's not only the blessings God had sent him, but the bounty God had supplied. Philippians 4 19. Why was Paul able to tell the church of Philippi that his God would supply all of their need according to his son's riches and glory? I'll tell you why. It's because over and over and over again, God had supplied his need. Why was Paul able to have such confidence going through this issue in life? It's because God had been so good in meeting his needs through his life. Surely God has met all of ours. And a whole bunch of our wants. A whole bunch of our wants. Let me give you another one. What else was it? What caused him to have such confidence? It was not only the blessings God had sent, the bounty God had supplied, but the battles God had stopped. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to read this to you. This is why Paul's confidence level was so high in his life, he was meditating, no doubt, on what God had done. Why? Because God had persuaded him. God persuaded him. Look at verse number 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, watch, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by His coming only, but by the consolation wherewith He was comforted in you. When He told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. 
You know what, Paul? They'd been through a difficult time and God had comforted them and solved the battle and an issue in his life. Let me tell you what ought to help us to have confidence in life when we're going through a hard time is how many times God has been there to give you the peace of mind and control and conquer a battle that you're faced with in your life. My, my. Yes, sir. Let me give you an illustration of what this ought to do to Don, uh, Donald and Miss Julie. And by the way, for all those that don't know, Donald Tucker is not supporting Clay Aiken, all right? <laughs> At least I hope not, right? <laughs> but this issue with Julie, I've watched them. I saw you cut out of the right way. I know where that's going. But anyway, with Julie, she was tore up the other night. And when we was praying for her, it's a major, major issue. The cancer was outside, not contained on the inside. It caused a lot of worry. I mean, especially when you're hearing all the negativity that's going on with that. But now that they've done a surgery and everything, they've sent that to pathology and the pathology report come back negative for any type of cancer. Now, Donald, what that ought to do is build y'all's confidence in God. So that the next time you experience a trial, you'll be able to look back and be able to be confident also in helping somebody else that might need your encouragement because it's always better when you know somebody's been where you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And God may use you and Julie to encourage somebody else that might go through the same thing or worse than what y'all went through. That's how it works. So what built Paul's confidence up was the battles and the things and the issues that God had settled in his time past. I look at Brian and, and Jenny with the things they've been through. It's no secret. There's no thousand pound gorilla in the room. We've all been through things, but you've been through some things. And God bringing you little by little, baby step by baby step, hour, minute by second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, it's going to build your confidence. And who knows? I'm not saying that God wanted this to happen, but it did because of a bad decision. But God can use your bad decision to help somebody else that might go through the same thing or worse. And y'all can stand there with confidence and they will be able to see what God done in your life. Look up here, man, church. God sometimes allows you. We're going to talk sovereignty of God for a minute, all right? Amen. God will sometimes allow you on purpose to go through a tragic time in your life Amen. just to help somebody else. He'll let it happen. Todd, right here. God might have, I don't know why Todd can't see. Getting ready to be a benefit for Todd. I hope there's a lot of money raised. Whatever God wants to be raised, that's what's going to happen in their life. But I don't know why he's going through what he's going through. But during this time, God might have Todd and Sandra and their family had to move out of the house with them in laws over there. Got him right here at this time in his life. Why? God, for some reason, does. Let it might be to build your confidence up to help somebody. This whole thing might not be about you or even for you. You might not even know the person that God's got all this ordained for yet. Matter of fact, they might not even be born yet. Amen. What about the amount? Put that in your Armenian pot and smoke it. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to see that the confidence that you have in your life and what you're going through, God's putting you or allowing you to go through it and He's solving these problems to build your confidence to help somebody else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's it. Sam, your stuff's no secret. October the 1st was six months. You're a clean man. Ain't that a blessing, Mama? 
First time in a long time. I don't have to worry about your boy coming in over there and parking and shutting the garage door and going straight in the house. I know you're tickled to death. Don't have to worry about him driving drunk with them grandbabies or killing himself or somebody else. His marriage is together and things are better now. Looks like they've ever been or at least in a long time. Sam, use this time to build confidence in not yourself or your own ability, but in God's ability because somewhere down the road, somebody's going to need Sam to offer them a word of encouragement and it'll probably be a worse state of mind than you was in. And they might not even be born yet. Yes, sir. But somebody's going to need it. I feel so much God right now while I'm preaching and ministering to some people. I have no idea what He's doing, but I'm glad He's showing up to Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen, Pastor. Good. Because I couldn't do it. <laughs> but Paul was able to be confident during this time in his life because of what God had done in his past. He said, Preacher, I'm finding it hard right now to be strong and confident right now. Well, you need to look back in your life and see what God has done. Amen. If you're spiritual enough to look back at spiritual blessings and not just think about carnal things. This confidence that Paul had worth that I'm sharing with you. He was persuaded, he said, God persuaded him to build his confidence through the blessings that he sent, the bounty supplied, the battles he had stopped, the burdens he had soothed. I could go there, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where he talked about the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds, and all that stuff. He had experienced that. He had experienced burdens being soothed in his own life. But then the Bible God would share. That build his confidence up and persuade him. Because in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, flip over there, Paul wrote this. And here's what Paul had to say about the written word at that time, which the New Testament wasn't here, but they had the Old Testament scrolls. In Romans 15 verse 4, he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, which means before, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. You want me to tell you what persuaded Paul was the Word of God at that time? He said, I know who I believe. Do you really know? Do you know him? You want me to tell you why Paul knew him? He had experienced him. Amen. In his own life. Amen. You never know him until you do experience him. Amen. You cannot know him until you've experienced him. Amen. Amen. Paul said with assurance, I know who in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded. <laughs> in other words, he's got his foot on the rock and his mind's made up. Yeah. Amen. That'd be a good title for this. You know that. He's been persuaded. Watch this. Let me give you one more point we've done. Triumphing through trials. There's a cause worth suffering. There's a confidence worth sharing. But then there's a course worth staying. This whole verse in verse number 12 is really showing us and telling us, it's screaming, Paul saying, I'm staying the course. I know in whom I believe and I'm persuaded. In other words, I ain't backing up in that. I'm going to stay in the course that I'm on. Watch this. How was he able to do that? How was Paul able to stay the course and triumph through all these trials that he went through? Here's how. Watch this. Number one, because his trials didn't control his feelings. Look at verse 12. For which cause I also suffer these things nevertheless. Watch. I am not ashamed. You want me to tell you what he said right there? What I'm going through right now is not controlling how I feel. Let me say that again. He said, this issue that I'm wrestling with ain't controlling my feelings. He had control of his own emotions. Boy, that keeps a lot of us in the high, don't it? Yeah. Huh? That's why he was able to stay the course. Because his trial didn't control his feelings. He said, I ain't ashamed. 
Some of y'all probably think I ought to be ashamed, but I ain't ashamed. Why? He knew who he believed. And God had already persuaded him. Huh? He had his foot on a rock and his mind was made up. Now, feelings are a very powerful thing. And feelings, a lot of times, they control what we say and what we do. I better not get into a lot of feelings right now. It's not a good time. Especially when you live with three women. Amen. <laughs> Paul was able to stay the course because his trial didn't control his feelings, number two. But also his trial didn't change his focus. Look at verse 12 again. He said, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Watch, for I know whom I believe. In other words, his focus was not changed one bit by what he was going through in his life. I'm going to get a little bit personal right here, but not real personal. When I come to y'all's house and talk to y'all after a great event, and I've done talking to a lot of other people the same thing, what was the first thing I told y'all after we opened it up? I said, work on your relationship with dude. Exactly right. How many times I tell y'all that? Over and over and over and over again. See, a lot of times we'll try to fix our issue. When really the main issue that needs fixing is our relationship with God. You've got to keep your focus on Him. Amen. Paul's focus didn't change. That's why he was able to stay the course. He said, I know who I believe and my eyes are on it. You better keep your eyes on the Lord or you will be swayed to one side or the other. Amen. The course we're saying. He was able to stay the course because his trial didn't control his feelings didn't change his focus, but it didn't crush his faith. He said, and am persuaded. Verse 12. In other words, he still had his faith in God. But then here's his last one. Here's why he was able to stay the course. Because his trial didn't cloud his future. Look at verse 12 again. I'll read it one more time. For the which cause I also, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Against, here's the future, that day. In other words, his trial didn't cloud his future. He still knew that regardless as to what happened in this life, he still had a better future. And there's a better day a coming. I promise you that. This too shall pass. And if there's one thing that will help you make it through a trying time in your life, is to see a light at the end of the tunnel. You want me to tell you who that light is at the end of the tunnel? Jesus is the light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. I'll share this little story with you and I'm going to close. There's a guy over here close by that's getting ready to pass and going to eternity. I've been over there two or three times. His name is Dexter Church. And uh, some of y'all in here know him. He's still alive, which I can't believe unless he's passed away in the last little bit. He's got cancer, he's terminal, he's getting ready to leave out of here and check out. If there's one thing that I hope that people are able to see, and that's why I've been over there so much, is because I'm wanting to make sure he's prepared to meet God for some reason or other. Now he's to the point to where I don't think he'd be able to talk in his right mind, but he's told me time and time again that he's prepared to meet the Lord, and that's all I can go on. And I had him go into detail with me some. I want to know, when it comes down to your last few days on earth, then's not time to be playing no games with God. You're about to meet him. I mean, that's just how it is. There's a little light at the end of that tunnel. When a person is getting ready to leave this world and go out into eternity, even though down here your future may not look that bright, if you know Him, I don't know what death is like. I've never experienced but a spiritual death. I've experienced a spiritual resurrection in my yes, life too. Yes, yes. I know what it's like to be raised from the dead spiritually. And you do too. Yes, right. I don't know what it's like to have experienced a physical death, but one day we all will. But for some reason or other, I've watched enough people leave this life and go into eternity. And if you've ever watched many, you've seen it too. There's something that happens right before they leave out. 
I mean, I, I've seen I've seen people that get ready to leave out of here, and something strange happens. You know, and it's never the same. You can't say, "Well, they're getting ready to leave; they're going to raise their left thumb." No, it's it's never the same. But something happens. I'm not saying that you need to watch somebody pass away, but don't be afraid to leave the room if you've got a loved one that knows God. Stay in there with them and hold their hand. Okay? Yes, sir. Don't be don't leave them unto God when they're getting ready to leave this world. Stay with them, please. Amen. Gordon, I've heard you talk about your mama. Didn't she pass away in your arms? Is that right? I remember, remember Virgil six. Miss Joy had been up there and there he'd laid. Thought he was going to die any time. That was a tough old rascal. You know that? You want me to tell you why I think he was so tough? Because he had so much joy in his life. I think that's <laughs> what he was. <laughs> but I had just walked out of the room and that guy he used to drive a truck with he'd been waiting on finally come up. Virgil hadn't done nothing in two or three days. Then all of a sudden, right before he died, what happened, Miss Debbie? Yeah. Hands started lifting. This guy, Virgil hadn't moved. He had laid there with the death wrap for days. Smile comes on his face and his hands start raising up. Let me tell you what I think he saw. He saw a light. I think as this life was a closing, there was another life of opening up, Amen. which was eternal life that had been in him ever since he had got saved, but now his faith was being made reality and he was seeing it in all of its glory and he took off and fluttered like an angel into the glory world. Glory to God. I don't know why, but I got goosebumps on me right now. And I just heard Virgil go, Hallelujah! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if that won't help you try up through a little trial, for this light affliction, that's why Paul was able to say this in Romans chapter 8. For this light affliction worketh for us a far more than exceeding eternal way of glory. We ain't seen nothing yet. We ain't even seen the icing that's going. We ain't even seen the cake. With real eyes of faith yet. We're looking at it through a glass and it's kind of dingy and dark. We see it in the Scripture and we know that it's there and every once in a while we'll see a sparkle of its glory just enough to keep your attention. One of these days it's going to be face to face. And that's that future that we all have and Paul's future didn't get clouded. Don't get your tent pegged. Put in the ground too far down here. So true. Because we ain't a staying here, friend. We are leaving out one day, sooner or later. One day, our name will be changed to God. <laughs> Father, we love you tonight. Lord, we thank you for ministering to our hearts this evening. Lord, we thank you for touching and speaking and doing what you do best. Lord, we pray the words that's been shared tonight will find a lodging place in the hearts of the listeners this evening. We know that it's went forth and know that some have no doubt received help from it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let me share a couple.